Welcome everyone. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development and New Programs, and you're joining us at noon on Wednesday, so it's time for our Wednesday webinar. And today I have with me Andrea Shirley, Dr. Andrea Shirley, from Ursuline in Texas, and we're excited to talk to you a little bit about decision making during a time of year where academic leaders are making a lot of decisions. I'm just going to share my screen with you for just a moment. And here we go. Here's a little bit um, about what we're going to be talking about today with decision making. And then, as always, on our blog, we've got some writing on this topic. We've got managing the unpredictable during a time of year where you don't necessarily know what's going to come into the office next. And next week, we're going to talk about communicating those decisions. So once you've made them, how do you communicate them effectively? So every week we take a pulse survey and we ask some questions and this week I wrote a little bit about the Eisenhower matrix which is a framework for handling decision making and time management when you are a leader and it focuses on a couple of different questions which is what's urgent and what's important and then helps you frame those out a little bit. Um, so I think we'll have a link to both the pulse and the blog in our chat if you'd like to check either of those out but Here's what's intriguing. In that Pulse results, it found out academic leaders right now are spending 94% of their time on things that are both urgent and important. And then Andy, you and I both sort of mused a little bit about how it's kind of sad that folks are still having to spend some time on things that are not urgent and not important, but somehow I guess are getting their way in there. Mm -hmm. but, um, wow. So urgent and important, and Andy, you are joining us here to talk about how academic leaders can handle those. It's urgent and it's important, and I have to do it all right now. So folks, if you've got a question, please do put that in the Q&A. We've got time for questions and answers afterwards, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And if you've got a resource to share too, if you're here, feel free to include that in the chat. So thank you everyone. So Andy, will you just introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about you and your role as principal of Ursuline Academy in Dallas? Sure. So yeah, I'm in my starting my eighth year of principal here and it's a tricky thing y'all. All over the world, it's either Ursuline or Ursuline. So we are Ursuline, New Orleans friends are Ursuline, uh, but it all works and you know, we, we're, it, we, we're all good friends about it. So yeah, so this is my eighth year at Ursuline Academy of Dallas. And uh, prior to that, I was also in education at uh, Schools of the Sacred Heart in San Francisco. Um, we are a Catholic uh, girls high school, and um, we have been uh, very happy to be partners with One Schoolhouse for quite a while. Great. Thank you. Um, so how are you, really? Really. So really fine and also really, ugh. you know, I, it, both things are true. I, I, there's, there's definitely some things happening right now I wish were not happening and those are global things as well as local things to us. Um, but mostly I'm, I'm all right. I'm all right. You know, we're ready. Yeah. So if you're in the chat, will you share the date of your first day of school for students? Um, just because I always think that's interesting to see. Some have been in school for a couple of weeks and some of you, it's still weeks away. So Andy, where is it for you? So we are in orientations with our students right now by grade level and Monday will be when classes begin. Okay. So you're pretty close. We're close. You're right up on that. So you came today to talk to everybody about strategies that academic leaders can leverage to help teachers and their students open the year really well. And those, so that's what academic leaders are focused on right now. How do we open the year the best way that we can? And you said something when we were planning that I want to share with everyone to kind of really set the frame around this. You said that your role was to illuminate the right path to joy. And I just love that. And I've been sharing that with everybody I've talked to since. Can you talk a little bit more about how that guides you? Sure. So there, it is not hard to get pulled into all of the things that are just really feeling like challenges right now. And it's not honest to say, oh, it's all great, fine sunshine and flowers. That's not honest either. But joy can, joy can reside in the middle. Joy can be something that acknowledges the challenges and also sees the beauty. Um, 
it's it we say it all the time but truly it is i mean our our students are kind of a renewable energy source of joy and that's something that you know helps us to keep grounded in that in that immediate moment um we also when we take the time to think about why we do what we do why we come here why we come here not just why we come to school and work but why we come to this school what is it about this school and our mission and our community and what we build together that allows us to find those paths to joy there's like i said the lived example or the lived the lived the lived inspiration of our students there's the shared inspiration of our mission and our community and um i just honestly i cannot i, I just can't find myself staying away from joy too much when I when I'm interacting and with with these people who we have these shared moments with, and again, it doesn't mean that we're pretending everything is easy and everything is great, but there is so much so much to be joyful about. I love that, and you know, one of the assignments in our um, we've got an intro to girls, intro to boys, intro to indie schools <laughs> courses that we do in the summer, and one of the assignments is what about your school's mission resonated with you as an applicant. And are you excited about living as a new member of the school community? And there's just some really eloquent, beautiful thoughts from new teachers on that. So, um, and I know many of you here will, or watching this webinar, will have some of those teachers. So that might be a fruitful conversation topic. Great. So one of the challenges this time of year is that you have to move into decisions quickly. And, Liz and Brad have called that whack-a-mole decision-making here at One Schoolhouse, where you get one decision knocked out and two more pop up in the corner and then you've got to deal with those and another one comes. So what might be a leisurely conversation in June, you know, somebody wants to make a curriculum adjustment, you just can't have it the same way. Um, so when you are, are thinking about this, what is one of the strategies that you like to use? I know I like to protect time in my calendar so that I can be reactive and responsive. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you do something similar. I do. Yeah, I, I try to build in. Um, I actually plug it into the calendar so that if somebody tries to schedule a meeting with me, they will see the time is blocked off um, for for kind of being open to whatever I need to be open to. I use that time a lot for walking around the building, popping in, just seeing what's going on. Um, and, you know, and sometimes the, those times invite us to opportunities to uh, be able to exercise the that that value of this is urgent important. Um, I, I, there was literally a day a few years ago where we live in Texas, so it's it's just it's just a thing. But there we had a rain, and there was some water in a classroom, and so I, I happened to kind of turn the corner right as the teacher was coming out and realizing that. And also in the hallway there was a little roach. So we had to deal with two little things: screaming girls and water dripping and it was just a moment of like okay we're going to dispatch the roach we're going to get rid of it it's all good and let's get the we can solve this but in that moment it, it it those are the kinds of things that you just never know might literally be around the corner and there are also opportunities to be with your community to model for kids how to maybe not completely flip out when something unexpected is around the corner but also to help your teachers take that role of we're going to model this together for the girls and you know so those times they're not always that exciting but they're always fruitful in in some way the times that i just block out to go and be in the community i think that's super important um and you remind me of when i was living in a dormitory apartment we had an early morning knock on the door not ridiculously early but early and there was a cup and it had a sticky note next to it huge spider please kill <laughs> and my husband said i think they left this for me and i said i think so i think it shows that you have built some trust in this community and, and so here they are um so he actually took it outside so anyway but i think that's just you know that's that part of the you don't know what's going to show up and so when you don't know what's gonna show up, do you have a framework that you use when you're thinking about decisions this time of year? Well, something that is, is helpful is having established practices around decision-making. So when you are in a moment, when you have a little leisure time to, to be really thoughtful about a decision, you can, you really can, can, can build the habits of checking in, does this 
meet our mission? Is this aligning with our strategic imperatives and our roadmap for where we need to be? Is this supporting what we as a school have decided are our key initiatives that we are really you know, attending to right now? Building those habits when you have the time makes it easier to draw on them later when perhaps you don't have that much time. And I think it's really easy. I, when, I, when I was working on my dissertation, uh, one of the books I got to read, I love this book, uh, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. And I'm not going to even attempt to distill this book because it is so uh, heady and amazing. But reading it really helped me understand as a human being how I make decisions and the ways that I, what I apply. So Kahneman talks about two systems and he talks about system one, which is automatic and quick, takes little or no effort, um, no sense of voluntary control. And system two is when you really in, interrogate what's happening, you give thought, you're, you're really looking at things from all angle, it takes more work. Uh, system one thinking is, is helpful. It, it helps us identify threats. It, it helps us you know, navigate a way home on a familiar road. It, it helps us remember some facts that are important, recognize people we know, um, but it can also uh, help, it can also hinder us by encouraging us to lean too much on those little heuristics that we develop over time, which lead us to assumptions and false reasoning, stereotyping. So I really appreciated just understanding how the human mind works and how much we lean on that sort of quick, easy thinking because it's efficient and it's how our brains are built and how often that is not going to help us make the thoughtful decisions. And so this is an imperfect application of it, but I try to consider opportunities to use the systems two level thinking by ingraining those habits of mission-based, you know, student-focused thinking around decision-making. So what I really like the way that, about the way you've described that is it's something that you set up and, and work on the way that you approach and think about things when you are not in the middle of it. Uh -huh. And then those become habits and so you, you can take that pause. We're fond here at One School House of saying, take a pause mm -hmm. or, and do that. Right. When you're building a new strategy like that, do you find that you do some self-talk, like you were describing some questions? Is that something that you do? Definitely. Um, I really do try to, and it's also for me, having a phenomenal team of people who will say, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on, wait a second, before we go down that route, who will help sort of be my voice for me um, when I'm maybe not in the moment of, of doing it well. But those, those internal pauses of, okay, think about this. Is this, really, is this really this urgent? Do we have to answer this right this second? Because some, when somebody comes to you with something that is urgent to them, it might be urgent to them, but it might not necessarily be something that operationally, organizationally needs to be solved right in that moment. One of my favorites, uh, tools that I that I use sometimes is an old like I think from the 70s uh, Harvard Business uh, Review article about monkey management and the concept is basically somebody you see somebody in the hallway and they say hey this thing isn't working for me can you help me with that and you're saying no problem I'll, I'll take care of it and they've just handed you a monkey and now you're walking around with their with their burden and their problem. So we, uh, in my team, we talk about it some, you know, pretty frequently of, did you take a monkey just then? Or was that what you just did? And I try to ask myself that question because when somebody comes to you, you wanna help, you wanna serve them, you wanna make their life better. And sometimes the way you make it better is by saying, that's a great question. Can you do some digging on, on that for me? Can you come back to me with some research and ideas? And then we'll, we'll see about it, but not taking that monkey. Yeah, and so um, besides the obvious that you can't do everything, um, why is this so valuable when you say to someone, hey, can you do some digging and, and you send them off with that assignment? The, the, what really, it might, it might make them feel a little, a little worried in the moment, but ultimately it gives them power. It gives them power to realize they can solve problems. They can work through a challenge that is that maybe they didn't think they could and they know I trust them. They know that I trust them to do to do something helpful and good. And that and that and then I hope that that is empowering for the for the people who I've um, pushed off. Yeah. <laughs> Not 
Well, it sounds like you're really drawing on some empathy as well when you do that. You're trying to, to consider what does this person need, not what do you need? Oh, definitely. And I think, oh gosh, empathy can be something that it, it's, it's a little bit goes a long way. And I think it can also, if you if you go too far into it, you might find yourself taking too many burdens on, which doesn't help anybody either. But when I see that somebody could use that help and use use that sense of, of oh, you're trusted and I believe in you and I see that this is an important problem and right now you are the one to solve it, I, I, I hope that that comes across as that, that care, and feeling, care and empathy that I am feeling. Yeah, one of the things that we talked about when we were planning this webinar is the difference between decision making and walking with someone while they're making a decision. Yeah, yeah. And it sounds to me like you're really drawing a line there um, that's powerful. Yeah, we I do try. And again, um, having people around who know what they're doing. And honestly, this is something that we've all, um, I hope that anyone who was in education last year is, is holding this as a really important uh, tool in your toolkit, we did a lot and we did things we never thought we could do. And we really learned that we can do school when things are hard and that we can do school well when things are hard. And that we can serve our community, we can serve our, serve our, serve our students, serve each other. So I, I definitely, I hope that confidence is something that everyone is feeling because whether or not it was something that, that we wanted, we all, we all learned that we could. Yeah, and I think um, we might need to be reminded of that yeah. Yeah. repeatedly. Yes, yes. And I think that tied into that is the idea of frequently reflecting on where we are and what skill sets we feel really good about and what skill sets we don't maybe feel good about. And unfortunately, sometimes you learn, oh, I think I need to brush up on my feedback approach because that conversation did not go well. So you sometimes learn in a very immediate moment, but what I try to do just as a personal practice is just spend time thinking about what has worked well for me, what has helped me, and where do I maybe need to just pay a little more attention to to make sure that I am there to be empathetic when my team needs it and I am there to recognize and help them recognize maybe we are not in the right headspace to be thinking through this decision um, as thoughtfully as we need to. Um, the, and, and, and it is actually, even though things can feel like they're so urgent and necessary, I'm not talking about the fire alarm has gone off, we don't have to have a staff meeting to decide if we're going to exit the building, but even when thing is something important like, okay, we're in a construction project right now, where it's a very exciting, it's large scale, multi-phase, and um, I know this will shock everyone who's ever been involved in a construction project. It's not exactly perfectly ready today. <laughs> no um, and, and we have classes on Monday. So it's mostly ready, it's mostly there, but there's a few things that we're gonna have to work around. And I just came out of a meeting right before then where we were talking through, okay, we have a little challenge. It's a logistical delay of a few days but we don't have to turn it into a major problem. There are ways of working around it and we don't actually have to solve it right this second because we have questions we need answers to before we can do that. And it is kind of urgent because Monday is Monday. Um, and we recognize that we could just give a little space and take a little time. You know, we talked earlier about building time into your calendar for being responsive and being reactive to the unexpected. And I think what you've just drawn on too is the importance of even when it feels like everything's moving super fast, still being reflective. Yes, and it is definitely not easy. And so again, one of those practices that the more you build it up when you don't have the time constraint, the easier it is to tap into the practice when you really need it. Yeah, and I think some of those um, strategies that, you know, you kind of alluded to them earlier, other people have different ones, but the, the one line, how was the day exit ticket that we give to our students, we can also give those to ourselves at the end of the day, you know, what is your two lines, maybe as an academic leader, what, what's your exit ticket as you leave your office? Um, I think for me, I, I look at, I, I think about the things that felt really 
both urgent and important and ask myself, have I done what I can for those issues within the hours I had today? And sometimes the answer is no. And I'll say, I'll say to myself, then that is where I start tomorrow. And sometimes the answer is I did. And that's, that's okay. And that's, and that's a good feeling when you, when you have those things. That is right. And I think one of the hardest things about being a new academic leader for me was learning that you are going to walk out the door sometimes and tomorrow's to-do list is, is already going because you didn't get every single thing done. Like it isn't cleared. It's just right. cleared good enough. Right, right. Um, absolutely. And that can be so hard, especially when you want to, when you're new in your role, or even even when you've been in your role for a few years, you always want to do the best, and you want to you want to know that you're serving your community in the best way. Um, but yeah, and sometimes it's just an opportunity to be vulnerable and to say, "I really wanted to take care of this yesterday, and I know you needed this from me, and I'm going to get it to you in the morning." And I'm very sorry. I got I got I I got buried and I didn't do it. I know it's needed and I will do it. Acknowledging sometimes if you if you've missed the mark or say uh forgotten to or I, I'm going with forgetting because I forgot something recently and I'm remembering that quite dramatically right now. But just sometimes there are times where you just say I couldn't do it today, but I'm going to do it and I know it's important to you and we're going to get it done when we need to as it as we need to do it. Um, that that capacity of being able to own a misstep is, um, it's an important, I think I would recommend um, something to really try to find in yourself. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I just wanna remind everybody that you can ask questions in the Q&A and um, I could, someone messaged this one to me, but I think I could see why. What advice would you give to someone who's going into a new role? right now at a new school. So they don't know everybody. It was a rough year last year, no matter what kind of year you had. I think we can all acknowledge that. What's, what's a, something that you would recommend? You know, probably the same thing that, that you were recommending for your, for your teachers taking your, your new to girls or boys or independent school classes, spending time getting to know your, your culture and your mission, talk to people, listen, have those ears big and open. Um, figure out that, that you've got people around you you can trust and go to and, and understand, understand your resources. Um, I think, I, I really hope, I, I hope that no one is expecting a new leader to walk into a new school in a new role and uh, immediately have all the answers. That would be a really tough burden. And I think it's okay to recognize that you won't have all the answers. And there will be times where you'll say, oh, I knew this really well at my last school, but not now. And that is okay. It kind of goes back to that whole vulnerability, being able to say to you know, a colleague or, or, or somebody who's even reporting you to say, I don't think I'm getting this. Can you help me? And, and that is, I have found useful as a new leader, as a new, as a leader in a new school, but also, um, as, a, as somebody who's been here for a while. Yeah, Lori Palco, who works with us often, calls it level three listening. Yeah. Like not listening to, to every aspect of what's being said and what's not being said. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so a couple of questions. One is, can you tell us just a little bit more about Fast and Slow Thinking as a book? I think some we've got a link to yeah. the HBR article and a mention of the book, but... Sure. You mentioned it was in depth, so are you recommending? It is in depth. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely in depth. I mean, you can also, um, I mean, Daniel Kahneman's done some pretty great. He's been a podcast guest on some things. If you were to Google him, you would probably find some great places where he's come to talk about it. Because, I mean, this thing is it's big, and that type is that's that's little. Um, I actually, I actually got it as an audio book and listened to it as well. Um, it's. For, it's a, he's so if you know Kahneman at all, he's actually an economist, and he and as part of his understanding about why people function in or why economies function, it became why do people do the things they do? Why do they make the economic decisions that they make? And he started to realize that there there is this we think we and this is every human assesses ourselves as better at making decisions than we actually are, and it is because and it's and it's literally built into how our brains are how our brains are made and how we and how we build it um and again it's 
even though this is describing how we make decisions, it's not necessarily going to tell you how to make better decisions, but it should make you, it should help you be aware of what is happening in your brain when you're making decisions under duress, when you're making decisions um, about something that is exciting, when you're making decisions about something that you're, that you're not feeling good about, all of the different things that can, that can wake you know, can kind of pop in your brain to, and so, and again, it's not a bad idea. It's not bad. Systems one thinking, system one thinking is not a bad way of thinking. It helps us get through the world, but it you is gotta dry up the water, way. right? And get exactly. the roaches out. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and if we're only, only, only functioning in that system one, you know, area, we are missing out on some really deep opera or opportunities for just deeper and more, um, effective, thoughtful processes. Yeah. We've got an interesting observation that um, the person just sent to us, but I think it's for everybody. So if you um, drop something in the chat, make sure that it goes to all, to everyone, to all attendees. And then Andy, what are you excited about? What are you really looking forward to this year? Well, I mentioned the new building. We're, we're really excited about that and, and getting into those beautiful new spaces and seeing how our community uh, absorbs it and, and, and what, what changes that brings um, and how we, how we navigate uh, some exciting new spaces. Uh, I'm also excited that we're, we, we made a commitment as an administrative team that this was going to be a year where we weren't going to ask our teachers to do something big and new. So instead, what we're really doing is digging deep into practices that we collectively identified as valuable from last year. So last year, we were really lucky to be able to make an investment into Microsoft Hubs. And so we've got these phenomenal tools in all of our classroom. And last year, their primary role was to get kids into the room and to get teachers to find their kids. However, you know, now it's time to, we've got this thing and look what else we can do with it. Look how these teachers used it last year to enhance collaboration. Look how this teacher has figured out a way to um, bring in so many exciting speakers that we would have never been able to do before in a way that is really interactive with the kids and not just a, you know, a big, you know, talking head up on a, on a um, projector. We, so yeah, so we're, we're really digging into these, 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 skills and competencies that we had to learn about and explore last year. And now we get to explore and experiencing experience them more, in a more in-depth way. Ooh, that is such an important transition, I think, to recognize. So you're at Ursuline and you used to, last year you had to, and this year you get to. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a big takeaway that folks could take back to their school. What did you have to do last year that you get to do this year as a guiding question? Um, thank you. That's, that's, that's a super insight. Um, so we have one other question here. And, um, and I'm also good. I, I understand why this one came in as a chat, but I do encourage everybody to use a QA and a if you can. Um, when someone really needs time and attention during a time when you don't have the luxury of saying, come into my office, let's really sit and process and work through this for an hour. What are some strategies that you as a leader use to, to both help that person and not get de delayed from all of the 94% urgent and important and it has to happen today kind of stuff? You know, something that I've been encouraging my team and also reminding myself to do sorry my phone will start ringing in a minute um is is to is to if you really recognize how you are in the day and what you're carrying kind of checking in with yourself periodically uh when i walked in today i had some pretty some pretty um heavy uh unexpected kind of concerns that were right here and I, I had to recognize that they were right here and what i hope is that if somebody had come to me with something additional beyond that, I would have been able to say, I want to be able to give time to this conversation. This is not the moment. Can we find time later today or tomorrow? Or I am not going to be able to give you the ear that I want to give you right now. However, I do know that if your question is about you know, how, the teal practices that we're asking everyone to do, you can go and talk to this person or this person, and I'm pretty sure right now they're available because they're not a sophomore level advisor or just so either let them know I hear you, this is important, 
I can't be the person I want to be in the conversation right now. And there will be a time when I can, or to say, I cannot be that person right now. You need this right now. And there is someone who can be that person for you. I think that's so insightful. It's a little bit of triage and a little bit of relying on the healthy professional trusting relationships that you've been investing in over the years. And it, it, it really comes together that way. Yeah. Well, thank you. We are out of time, um, but I can't thank you enough for coming because I know you have to get back to it. <laughs> and so for those of you who are watching this, you know, while you're walking or listening while you're walking, we are glad that you're here and um, have a wonderful year, everyone. Get, get that, find that joy as you start your school. Thank you. Bye-bye.